Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. This is really excited. There's over 120 Zoom participants. I appreciate you all taking your time um, today to join us. My name is Verna Mendez. I am the Deputy Director at the Nevada Conservation League. And I wanna say welcome to all of you to the Nevada Conservation Network's Legislative Preview event. Um, so this event was created in coalition with our wonderful partners who all care about conservation and climate issues and policy. So before we get started, I think it's really important that uh, we acknowledge the land that we're on. I'm joining you from Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm on Southern Paiute land. Um, and this is really important to acknowledge who the original stewards of the land are, especially when we're talking about the issues of preservation and our environment. Another thing that we have to make note of is today is not only the very first day of legislative session, but it is also the first day of Black History Month. Black people have made countless contributions to American society and to climate and conservation issues. However, they have historically been left out of the conservation movement, even though Black communities remain one of the communities that are disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. We do believe here at the Nevada Conservation League that this intentional exclusion of voices needs to stop. So I want to give a big shout out to the new administration. As you know, President Joe Biden has appointed Michael Regan as head of the Environmental Protection Agency. Once confirmed, Mr. Regan will be the first black man and the second black person ever to lead the agency. Regan has a strong environmental justice uh, record behind him. He's a strong environmental justice champion, and he has promised to prioritize environmental policy that will serve all of us, not just major corporations. So this is really important to acknowledge right now and for the coming years. Uh, environmental justice is something that the Nevada Conservation League cares deeply about, and we need to make sure that we do not exclude any voices from the movement. So before we get started, I just want to lay out a couple rules. A couple things are happening right now. As all of you know, it is the very first day of session, so bear with us. There's still assembly still in, on the floor, so if we're going to move things around, we do apologize. If the schedule gets postponed a little bit, uh, you would have you will have to bear with us. Typically, we don't necessarily know how things are going to happen in a traditional session. And this has just been exacerbated because, you know, we're still in COVID times and session is happening, happening virtually. Um, but we will get the show on the road with some ground rules that we want to establish first. All mics are going to be muted. The cameras are going to be off unless you are a panelist. You will have opportunities to ask a question and all of the questions are going to be right in the chat box. So if you have any questions for the panelists, any questions for the legislators that are going to be joining us, please just hop in and put them right in the chat box. Um, while you all are on Zoom right now, if you could take a couple minutes, um, just say a good hello to anyone that you know in the chat box, um, all of the panelists, if you can please change your name um, to reflect the organization that you're with and with the pronouns as well. Just take a couple seconds to do that before we get started. And the last thing, please be respectful of our guest. Please be polite. If you are disrespectful, we're going to remove you. We don't want to, but just please keep in mind that, um, you know, the people that are here on this call are also people too, and just be respectful of everyone's time. All right. So before we get started, I just want to announce a couple changes that are happening here at the Nevada Conservation League. Um, as most of you know, I started in September. About a month before me, we did get a new executive director. His name is Paul Selberg. He started with us in August. I'm also really excited to announce that we have a new comms manager. Her name is Angeline Tabalba. And we also have a new organizing manager. His name is Andrew Sierra. So we are ramping up capacity at the Nevada Conservation League. Um, we plan to do a lot more exciting events in the years to come. So thank you so much for joining us for this uh, kickoff event. Um, it's it's going to be interesting. <laughs> I'll tell you that. NCL also wants to learn and hear from you. So if you can take a second, we have Andrew on the line. He's going to drop a survey in the chat box. This survey is going to be a community survey that Nevada Conservation League is putting out just because we wanna make sure that we listen to the voices of Nevadans and that you guys have an opportunity to tell us all of the issues that you care about. So if you could please take a second and fill out that survey. Um, it's going to talk about all of the environmental priorities that we are focusing on this session. And it's going to give you an opportunity to let us know what issues you care about. So please fill that out. Um, if you do want to get involved during session, Andrew's going to reach out to you and we're going to make sure to fold you into the program that we have going on here at the Nevada Conservation League. 
I just wanted to let you guys know um, a couple of surprising statistics that we have learned. In Nevada, we are fortunate to have so many legislators that care about conservation, public land protection, and climate change. Nevada Conservation League Education Fund conducted a poll that found that 82% of voters in the state consider climate change a serious problem, with 60% defining it at least as a very serious problem. An overwhelming majority of Nevadans support lawmakers taking a strong action to combat climate change, driven by the belief that such, such action will have a positive impact on future generations, health, and our economy. So with that, I'm going to just pause myself for one second. We're going to make sure that our legislators are able to join the call. We do have some really strong environmental champions here in Nevada, and I just want to make sure that we give them an opportunity to talk a little bit about themselves. So give me one second and let me make sure that our legislators are on. Thank you. So Senator Canazaro is going to be joining us in about 30 seconds. Just give us one second. Let us make sure that the microphone is connected, that the camera is up and running. So I'm going to mute myself here uh, just to make sure that everything is running smoothly. But as I said, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. We do have the Nevada Conservation League team monitoring the chat box. We do have some wonderful partner organizations that are going to be interacting with you as well. And if you are watching from Facebook, please feel free to drop any comments that you'd like, any feedback, give us any suggestions for new places that you'd like to eat feel free to interact with all of us here. Okay, so while we wait for Senate Majority Leader to jump on, I just wanted to give a shout out to the special partners that we have that joined us um, for this event. Um, as many of you know, and if you don't know, you're about to learn today, the Nevada Conservation League is part of a broader coalition called the Nevada Conservation Network. Um, this is a great network because it is a bunch of just organizations that come together because we all have a love and care for the environment and the ideology spreads all the way from left to conservative. We have a lot of progressives and we have a lot of conservative minded folks that are part of this coalition um, that all care about conservation and advancing climate justice. Um, so I wanted to give a shout out to the organizations that participated with us today and I'll read some of their names off for you. So hosting this event with the Nevada Conservation League, we have Battleborn Progress, Chispa Nevada, Eco Madres, Environment Nevada, Friends of Nevada Wilderness, Get Outdoors Nevada, Great Basin Resource Watch, Moms Clean Air Force, Natural Resources Defense Council, us, the Nevada Conservation League, Nevada Wildlife Federation, the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada, the Sierra Club Toyabi Chapter, Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, Boat Solar, and Western Resource Advocates. So we are all part of a broad coalition. We meet very frequently to talk about all of the issues that we care about here in Nevada. And we do like to learn from Nevadans and hear about the issues that you all care about as well. So that's why I wanna express again, the importance of filling out the community survey. Um, you know, none of our work would be done if we didn't, if we didn't hear from you. So please take a second, fill that out and um, we'll be right back and ensure that Senator Canazaro can go ahead and get started.
I'm so sorry, everyone. Please bear with us for one second. Um, I don't want you want to say technical difficulties or session difficulties. <laughs> We're just trying to find the names. All right, so because we're having trouble finding the Senator, what we're going to do is we're going to promote uh, Kyle Davis, he's with the Nevada Conservation League as a panelist. Um, something that's really exciting that happened in Nevada is um, we have the governor's office of energy and a bunch of other institutions here have conducted a climate research strategy. Um, there's a, some great reports that have come out about where Nevada, what Nevada needs to do specifically in order to meet our climate goals. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle to give us a couple minutes. He's going to give us a brief rundown of some of the findings of uh, some of the findings there. There you are, Kyle. Go ahead. All right. Well, thanks, Verna. And it's uh, it's great to be here uh, tonight and uh, happy to that we've got so many people logged in that are interested in what's going on with uh, conservation in uh, the legislative session that's coming up. So I did want to give just a couple of minutes just to make people aware. I'm sure many people that are a part of this uh, this event uh, tonight are aware of the state climate strategy, but was just hoping to highlight a few things. So um, if we go all the way back to the 2017 legislative session, it was during that session that a couple of things happened. One, um, the Go Governor Sisolak uh, joined Nevada in the U.S. Climate Alliance. Now, the U.S. Climate Alliance is a coalition of states and provinces and cities and counties that um, committed uh, to reaching the goals under the Paris Accord um, after uh, the, the the Trump administration signaled their uh, interest in moving away from the Paris Accord. Luckily, we are now moving back towards it, and our country will soon be a member again. But at the time, these states wanted to make it clear that we still felt that climate change was important and that we, it's something that we that needed to be dealt with. So Governor Sisolak joined us into the the. Um, Climate Alliance, and then also in the 2017 legislative session, um, the uh, also in the 2017 legislative session, Senator Brooks uh, sponsored SB 254, which set these uh, these goals in statute. So from that point, uh, Governor Sisolak then um, signed an executive order in November of 2019, tasking his administration with coming up with a state climate strategy. Um, and this was primarily led by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, as well as the uh, Governor's Office of Energy. Uh, they went through this process this year. There were a number of public um, um, listening sessions that were held in the fall of this year. And that strategy came out um, in at the beginning of December 2020. And what it does is it lays out an entire uh, st strategy for how the state should uh, deal with with climate. And there's a whole bunch of recommendations in there, some of which you see in legislation this session that you'll learn about in a little bit. But I think uh, I'll just highlight a couple of um, a couple of key points because it looks like we are we now um, are at a point where we've got legislators ready to talk. So the a couple of things that I'll just point out is that um, it proposes uh, closing emissions loopholes for uh, for uh, vehicles. It proposes uh, electrifying um, transportation and, and reducing uh, carbon pollution from the transportation sector. And it proposes moving away from fossil fuels in um, in our homes and businesses and really moving to a point where we can power all of our uh, all of our economy with clean renewable energy that we develop right here in Nevada. So um, I will uh, I will leave it there. I would encourage anybody that would like to um, that, will, that is interested, can, you can go to the website. The website is climateaction.nv.gov, and I'll drop that in the chat as well um, if you want to learn more about that. But with that, I will turn it back over to Verna. 
Thank you, Kyle. Wonderful news to hear. Great things are happening here in Nevada. So, okay, again, I'm sorry for the delays at the beginning, everyone. We just wanted to make sure that we give our wonderful legislators an opportunity to speak and give us a little bit of a brief rundown of what session's going to look like and about all of the great things that Nevada is going to do for this session. So with that, we are being joined by Senator Brooks as we speak. Um, Senator Brooks is a great environmental champion here in Nevada. And Senator Brooks, I'll go ahead and I'll give you a couple minutes to just share what you think this session is going to look like and also some previous legislative victories that we've seen. And then we'll reserve the last two minutes just to filter through any any questions in the chat box. Thank you for joining. Oh, thank you, Verna. And uh, apologize for, for jumping in and out, but we had a floor session that's kind of gone long and we're gonna have to go back onto it. And so uh, typical uh, legislative session, but it started on day one. So uh, um, thank, thank you for, for putting this together too, by the way, and, and, and being able to, to talk to everybody about what we're gonna do this session. So uh, Kyle had mentioned, some of the things that uh, we all collectively as a legislature did in the 2019 session and then what the governor did um, by joining the Climate Alliance and then all the subsequent work that's come out of that that um, stuff that we did in the session and 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 the, the membership of the to the Climate Alliance. We came out, uh, the, the governors, and it came out with, uh, uh, um, NDEP came out with a report that cataloged uh, our greenhouse gas emissions as a result of, of a bill that we worked on last session, 254. And then came up with uh, some some actions and uh, a whole a whole uh, guide on on what we as a state can do. It gives us some some great ways to implement policy and a lot of stuff that doesn't need any any statutory changes. But uh, as a result of of just kind of keep moving the agenda forward, even in uh, a cl in a climate that we face right now with the budget and what's going to be just a a really difficult legislative session from a budget standpoint, but also from uh, logistics um, because of, of the COVID crisis, we still need to move the, move the agenda forward. And there are ways that we can, that are budget neutral, that we can make big impacts. And so I have uh, what has turned out to be a, um, a, a big uh, energy bill, um, for lack of a better term, and that is going to um, help us move the Nevada's new energy economy forward. And in it, it will have um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure um, plans, um, and it will have a, a, a alignment of our IRP process, integrated resource planning for the electric utilities. It will have that integrated, or excuse me, aligned with our carbon reduction goals. So it won't just be the renewable portfolio standard anymore that um, is guiding how we invest in clean energy in the state. We're actually going to use the carbon reduction goals of the state to, to guide um, clean energy investments in our state. Um, it also um, will incentivize and, um, and prioritize uh, new electric transmission in our state to open up tens, you know, at, at, at first glance, about $10 billion worth of investment in clean energy around the state of Nevada. And, um, and it will create opportunities for rooftop solar for um, tenants and, and, and folks who didn't, tenants in multifamily housing for folks who generally haven't been able to participate in rooftop solar. So that's a, I'm, I'm, it's going to be one big bill, and and uh, and I'm currently um, uh, finalizing that right now. But um, that's uh, we can do this even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of a uh, a, a massive economic downturn. We can take advantage of of this legislative session to move the ball forward on climate and also create um, jobs and good paying jobs and um, tax revenues. I think we, all of these things live, can, can live together and we can achieve all of the goals at the same time. So that is, uh, that's what I'm working on and, and with some of my peers over here in the Senate and I'm sure in the assembly as well. Thank you, Senator Brooks. We do have one question in the chat box. Can you um, tell us if you know the number to the bill that you're referring to? What's that BDR number? Uh, sure. So I, there's probably about five different BDRs, but they're all going to be combined into one bill. That was uh, for for both po political reasons and for drafting reasons. Um, I'm currently um, uh, 
putting them all into one bill. I don't have that BDR number. Uh, it, it's it's a uh, pertains to provisions relating to energy. Very descriptive. So um, you can find it. <laughs> you can find it based on that descriptor. I just can't remember the uh, BDR number right now. Yeah, no worries. So what we're going to do, um, all of the folks who are RSVP for this event, you are all going to get some follow-up information. So we'll make sure to circle back with you, Senator Brooks, and find what that number is. That way, all of the attendees can follow along. And right. one last question for you, Senator Brooks. Um, what are you looking forward to the most this session? And it doesn't have to be anything bill-related in general. What are you looking forward to the most this session? Signy die. <laughs> uh, no. Great answer. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, uh, being able to expand uh, the clean energy opportunities in the state of Nevada through transmission investment. I think it's long overdue, and uh, it's always been incredibly politically difficult to get it done um, because the largest ratepayers in the state just don't want to see any sort of uh, any sort of rate impact, even though it's, it's very small and spread over decades. Uh uh, that that is something that takes a long time to plan, and it and we are decades behind in doing it. And to really get to the next level on deep decarbonization at at, at an affordable price, uh, we need massive transmission infrastructure investments. So that's what I'm really the most excited about, um, and 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 seeing that happen. Um, and that, and then electric vehicle charging infrastructure. I've worked with many of the partners um, on this call, and and specifically, I'd like to to, to thank. Rudy at Zamora at Chispa and all the work that Chispa did with uh, NRDC and WRA to really come up with a thoughtful way to make investments in charging infrastructure that benefit Nevadans who really need to, need the charging infrastructure the most. Nevadans who, who have been disproportionately impacted by the air quality associated with our current transportation system and who have missed opportunities to be able to take advantage in this clean energy economy. So I much thanks and, 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 and for all the hard work that Rudy and Chispa did with uh, NRDC and WRA. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Senator Brooks. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, we know that things are a little bit hectic on the first day of session, but we really do appreciate you talking to all of the folks here in Nevada that care about the same issues that you care about. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Just keep up, keep up your good, all the hard work. We're going to need all the help we can get this session. So we do have Senator Canazaro. She was actually able to join us. Sorry for the delay there in the beginning. Um, let me see if we can find her. Oh, there she is. Hi, Senator Canazaro. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Great to have you. So why don't you go ahead and um, just give us a little bit of a rundown of what you think this session is going to look like and anything that you're looking forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I did not also say thank you so much to the Nevada Conservation League for all of the really hard work that you do here in this state to help advocate for our public lands, um, for a clean energy economy, and for just generally keeping Nevada the beautiful place that it has been um, since I was born here and, 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 um, and for all of us to continue to appreciate all of the amazing things that this state has to offer. So um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I think Senator Brooks is really truly hit on so many of the priorities that we have this legislative session um, and so many of the things we're going to be working on. And I think, you know, one of the one of the toughest challenges that we face is certainly the budget and the state budget. Um, this session will definitely be a huge piece of our conversations, um, how we move forward in the middle of this pandemic. How do we start to recover economically um, and what that means for the services we're able to provide for Nevadans and what that future future path forward looks like. Um, I definitely think we have a lot of tough decisions in terms of making sure that we have a balanced budget where we have a budget deficit. And so that's going to take, I think, a lot of thoughtful consideration for all of us to really take a look at those decisions and see if we can't find ways um, to make sure we're still providing those services um, and, and keeping the state in a good place. One of the key pieces that I think interconnects with that, that whole conversation and why I bring it up um, here is 
we really do have to start looking at ways in which we can start to create a stable economy here in the state where we can utilize um, our abilities, where we've taken such a great lead on clean energy here, on um, carbon transmissions and how to reduce those here in the state, where the governor has been working so hard on a climate action plan. Um, how do we start to capitalize on the leadership and the successes that we've seen here in Nevada to truly start to build our economy um, and start to include things like our clean energy sector? I think that's going to be such a huge piece of the economic recovery in light of the pandemic and something that I'm very much looking forward to working on. Senator Brooks mentioned the electric uh, vehicle infrastructure and some of the things that we can do in that vein. And I'm very excited to see where that takes us because I do think um, that there are great opportunities, not only for us to start to build our economy with a focus on electrification, um, but also to use that as a way to help create jobs here in the state, um, which I think is always going to be a good economic driver for all of us. Um, I was also excited to see in the governor's state of the state, his mention specifically of that same new energy economy that I've been talking about um, and his mentions and, and discussions um, about energy storage and some of the really innovative things that are happening in that space. How can we start to build on that? Because we know that Nevada has an abundance of natural energy, both in the form of wind and certainly in the form of sunshine. And so the better that we can utilize that to not only make sure we're taking climate change seriously and that we're tackling that head on, but also to help us as a state move into um, a more diverse economy in some place where we are going to be building jobs for the future. I think that's, that's really such a unique opportunity that we have. Um, and I think you're seeing exactly where our policies are meeting that opportunity and where we are really going to be able to capitalize on that um, and help to change Nevada for the better. I know that there are also a number of conversations happening around just continuing to protect our public lands, um, which is something that I've been a huge advocate for here at the legislature. Uh, we passed the, the um, Public Lands Day bill back in 2017 to celebrate the natural beauty that Nevada has to offer. And so how do we continue to preserve that here and continue to make sure that people here in the Silver State know what a beautiful place we live um, and to really get out there and explore, I think is going to be a huge topic of conversation as well. And so I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, and and I, you know, I, I think we have, and I it's tough being in the middle of the pandemic and needing to come up here and, and figure out how we can move the state forward. Um, but more than anything, I am I am hopeful and um, I'm staying positive about what it is that we are going to be able to accomplish um, to kind of help us see that light at the end of the tunnel. And this is a great place um, for us to be and, and how we're taking climate change seriously, I think is just an extraordinary chance for us um, to not only tackle that issue, but also to put Nevada um, in just a better spot. Thank you so much, Senator. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate the time. I know that you're very busy today and we appreciate you taking the time to run over from what you were doing to talk to us here, to talk to all of the folks that are on the Zoom, everyone watching on Facebook Live and all of our partner organizations. Um, thank you. So I'm gonna turn it over to our policy director, Christy. Um, she was looking at some questions in the chat box and we're going sure. to see if we have any good questions for you. Thank you. Hello, Majority Leader, and thank you again so much for being on with us tonight after a very busy day. Um, so Emily in the chat asked, I read in the Nevada climate strategy that we need to move away from using fossil fuels like oil and gas. Is the legislature planning on doing anything this session to start that process? Um, and I think that's an excellent question and absolutely the kinds of conversations that we have to be having. Um, we started that by passing Senate Bill 254 last session by putting into place a, um, a carbon reduction plan that I think is going to give us some good guidelines on how we can actually achieve that. Um, and so the answer, the short answer to your question is yes. And I do believe there are a number of pieces of legislation. And I apologize because I actually don't know the BDR numbers or the bill numbers off the top of my head. I'd have to go look it up on Nellis, um, which is our state legislative system. Really easy to navigate. Uh, but yes, we are going to start having that conversation. Um, it's part of the climate strategy from the governor's office. Um, it's something that 
that I know we have been invested in, certainly here in the Senate. Um, and yes, there are bills that we that are going to allow us to begin that conversation of how to long term start planning for that and taking the steps necessary now um, to achieve those goals. Thank you so much. And one more coming to you from Facebook. Uh, can you talk more about infrastructure projects the new administration is likely to champion? Maybe some that might even happen here in our state. Yeah, I, you know, I think one of the exciting things um, that we're seeing both at a federal level and here at the state level um, are the chance to really have those conversations about infrastructure. How do we start to create it? Um, I think we remain hopeful that we're going to be able to partner with the federal government to get additional support so that we can work together in unison, um, specifically with, I think, electric vehicle infrastructure and transportation needs. Um, those are those have been huge topics of conversation. Um, you heard Senator Brooks talk about that. Um, and I think that that is something that we're seeing not only here in the state of Nevada, but certainly on the federal level. So we're watching all of those pieces. Um, I'm hopeful we're going to be able to partner on a lot of those projects. Certainly um, capital improvement projects and the new energy economy has been a huge piece of the governor's state of the state and what we're eager to work with him on this legislative session. Um, and we'll be part of those budget conversations that I mentioned as well when it comes to those projects. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Senator. I know that you're really busy, so we won't take up more of your time. Thank you for joining us again on the first day of session. Uh, yeah, we really thank you. you. No, thank you so much, and I appreciate you having me. All right. Um, next up, I already see him here in the queue. We have Assemblyman Howard Watts. Um, Assemblyman Watts, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. So we do know that in Nevada, you are definitely a champion for all of the issues that we care about. Um, can you just give us a little bit of a rundown, same thing, what you look forward to this session, and also if you could talk about some previous legislative victories that we've had for conservation and for climate. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just to, I know some other speakers have talked about it as well, but Nevada plays such a critical role uh, in the conservation movement. You know, um, we're now getting a lot of traction with the effort to protect at least 30% of our lands and waters uh, for future generations. We know that's critical for biodiversity. It's critical for uh, access to the outdoors, for our mental and physical health. And Nevada really has the opportunity to lead in that effort in terms of conserving our public lands, our public waters and public spaces, uh, because we have the so much uh, public land in this state. So, um, you know, I'm really excited to see what we can do to uh, protect our special places and to make sure that we have protections in place for our air, uh, our water, um, and really that we take a focus on equity um, in, in our approach to these issues as well. You know, making sure that we are engaging the voices of uh, indigenous communities who have been here for countless generations, you know, making sure that we're addressing some of the health, economic, and other access disparities that communities of color have faced um, that are related to uh, environmental and conservation issues. So that's something that I'm really passionate about, um, as well as the senators who just spoke, um, taking action on climate change. You know, uh, Governor Sisolak has continued to move forward since last session when uh, we passed bills creating carbon reduction targets and increasing our commitment to uh, renewable energy. Uh, now we have a state climate strategy that lays out a variety of, of policies to help get our emissions down across every sector and ensure that uh, we hit our climate goals. You know, lastly, I think with COVID, um, the links between uh, conservation and health are clearer than ever. Many of the pollutants that we're talking about are also directly related to uh air pollution that affects our ability to breathe that leads to lung disease and puts us at risk for complications. Um, and, you know, additionally, the overarching effects of climate change, excessive heat, uh, drought, wildfire, all pose uh, a public health and safety risk. So uh, I'm very excited to, to be taking on some of those things. I have a couple of bills that actually fit into the climate strategy. Um, one of which we'll uh, hopefully be talking about soon. And, uh, you know, that's something that that I am extremely excited to to work on in this session, but we're not stopping there. Um, we are, uh, there are gonna be bills to, uh, 
to commit Nevada to the goals of protecting more of our uh, public lands and waters. Um, we're going to be looking at a range of legislation um, to protect our natural resources, our, our wildlife. Um, and again, I'm I'm excited to try and make sure that everybody's voice is at the table as the chair of the Assembly Natu Natural Resources Committee um, to have the maximum amount of participation and uh, to craft policy that uh, protects uh, our natural resources for future generations. Thank you so much, Assemblyman. So um, Christy has been monitoring the chat box and you have a lot of really good questions that have been dropped in here in the Zoom. Um, folks, also feel free to, if you're on Facebook Live, feel free to drop some questions in there as well. Um, so Christy, go ahead and take it away with a question for the Assemblyman. Um, so a question from Facebook, our trail systems are seeing heavy use during the pandemic. Can we get more money invested into these open spaces? Any thoughts Thanks. on that? Thanks. That's a great question. So uh, one of the things that I was really excited about that we also did in the last legislative session was extend our conservation bond program, um, which is able to pay for a wide range of conservation improvements um, it includes, um, you know, new facilities and recreational opportunities, uh, as well as um, doing work to um, repair damage from wildfires and protect and preserve habitat. Uh, and so that's going to be a major source of support um, for some new initiatives going forward. Things like the Springs Preserve um, were funded in the first round of, of conservation bonding. So uh, that's something that we have to look forward to to help expand uh, those prospects. Another thing that I can also say really quickly is, um, thankfully, one of the few things Congress was able to accomplish uh, in their last session was permanently reauthorizing and fully funding the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, and one of the huge benefits of that is it provides 50-50 matching grants um, for recreation projects here in the state. So that um, potentially is opening up a lot of uh, additional federal funding that state and local governments can match in order to expand uh, recreational opportunities in the state. So those are a couple of things. And, you know, I think we are committed to continuing to find ways to make sure that we're um, providing the um, recreational infrastructure that is needed um, in our, our open spaces. Thank you so much, Assemblyman. And one other question, this is from Sean in the chat. He says, climate change disproportionately affects communities of color, but it's still not seen as a racial justice issue. How do we change this thinking? Uh, that's a great question. I think one of the things that we need to do is just introduce it in the conversation wherever possible. It's great to see that there are so many participants on this Zoom meeting. So I would encourage all of you to work with uh, the Conservation League to, to understand the racial equity implications of conservation policy and speak up for them here at the legislature. Um, we are uh, committed, even though uh, the building's access is limited right now, to making sure that everybody can participate in the process and make their voice heard. And so I hope that um, you all will speak up on those issues. It also falls to people like me and other leaders in the legislature uh, to talk about um, the connections between racial justice and racial equity and conservation issues. And as I indicated earlier, it's something that I'm passionate about. And uh, one of the, the pieces of legislation that I'm excited to talk with you about this evening um, actually um, has some of those connections um, and is something that I'm really, really excited to be working on. Thank you, Assemblyman Watts. Um, do you have a couple of minutes to stick around? I know that GSPA wanted to see if you have some time to talk about a bill that you both are working on together. I know you probably are busy today, so if you have to run, that's okay too. Yep, I have a couple minutes and then I'll jump to my next meeting. Okay, no worries. So um, we're gonna turn it over. So this is the portion where we're gonna have the partners give a little bit of an update. I'll explain it a little bit further after this conversation that's going to happen with Assemblyman Watts and with um, Rudy Zamora from GSPA. But Rudy, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the piece of legislation that you both are working on together that's going to be absolutely great for Nevada. Oh, sorry, Rudy, you're on mute. Sorry, just first cut my one tonight. Good job. <laughs> Shut up. 
try to be used to this. So many Zoom meetings. Uh, but thank you, Verna. Thank you, Assemblyman Watts, for, for sticking around to help us with this uh, presentation. Um, as you mentioned, and as that last question um, came up from uh, about communities of color, I think this bill is definitely going to hit that that target that we were just talking about. And before I go into um, any of the like why we like this bill and what this bill is going to do, I would like to give you the the opportunity to share the the framework of the proposal if you have a couple of minutes before you have to run. Sure, um, and I'll, I'll try not to. Um, cover too much ground that you already would, Rudy. And if I do, I apologize in advance. So um, really briefly, uh, this bill has a few components to it. And I want to highlight two and kind of the process of how I, I got to this point. So um, the first is changing our classic cars program. Many of you may have seen cars on the roads that have classic vehicle plates, um, but they don't uh, look like kind of hobby enthusiast car show um, vehicles. And one of the reasons for that is after the law governing those plates was changed in 2011, um, people realized that they could use it as a loophole to avoid getting smog checks. Um, so people with older vehicles, um, polluting vehicles that are having issues with smog checks can use uh, these classic vehicle plates if their, their uh, car or truck is 20 years old or older in order to get around the smog check program. So as I already start, uh, stated earlier, I, I, once I learned about this, um, you know, it had been discussed in some of the uh, evaluations of climate issues by the state. And it's clearly something that between um, high traffic corridors being located in low income communities and communities of color, as well as the fact that often this is something kind of of necessity that um, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and lower income families are doing because they can't afford to make the repair or get a new vehicle. Um, I decided that this was something that I wanted to address and kind of close those loopholes so that we can get those polluting vehicles uh, either in compliance or off the roads. But I also realized that doing that was gonna have um, some significant impacts on people financially as the same time it was delivering health benefits in terms of taking that pollution out of those um, communities. So um, working with, um, with Chispa and others, um, I came up with a, an idea to adjust our um, smog fee. So when you go pay for say a, a $20 smog check, $6 of that goes to our state and local governments to uh, run air pollution control programs. And so if we adjusted that up to $10 um, and everyone paid $4 more on their smog check, um, we could bring in revenue to help support programs targeted to uh, uh, lower income communities and communities of color uh, to help repair. So to provide a voucher that covers the average cost of a repair for a vehicle that um, has failed a smog check or to help replace that vehicle uh, with a brand new clean electric alternative. Um, there are programs like this that have been implemented in uh, other states. They have been extremely successful. And, um, and again, they've been targeted specifically to the communities that need them the most. Um, and they provide that support upfront, which are things that we've seen to help make sure that the transition to uh, a clean energy economy, to uh, electric vehicles is, is accessible to everybody. And so that's uh, kind of the key uh, provisions of what this bill does and um, why I'm excited about it. So it's, it's one of the things, closing these loopholes was mentioned in the state's climate strategy. Um, I'm excited about um, being able to provide the resources uh, to do that while also um, increasing the impact that it has um, on, on creating equity in our communities for, for health outcomes, um, you know, a, a, and economic outcomes as well. Awesome, thank you, uh, Assemblyman Watts. So that does lead me into um, the next portion that I have. So Chispa is very supportive of this bill um, for a lot of the reasons that you just stated. And as you mentioned, you did take a lot of my talking points, but that's okay. Um, but one of the things that we do want to uh, focus on is that we like the, the idea of creating, um, identifying funds for programs to help low-income customers repair their polluting vehicles or replacing them with cleaner versions like 
as you mentioned, low or zero emission cars. Um, and we need to start talking about that because oftentimes when we talk about electric vehicles, we forget about um, our communities, uh, low income communities, communities of color, because we do not we do not have access to these vehicles on, on the go. Um, so we need to start somewhere. And this is a really good program that will allow us to make that transition. The other one, the other big reason why we love this, this uh, proposal is not only does it um, create um, the opportunity to fund programs to help the, the, the cars, but it also helps us um, find funding um, and the ability to remove, um, to create um, air quality stations around the state, um, and particularly in Washoe and in Clark County, which is where this bill would mostly be um, be impacted or have larger impact in both Clark and Washoe again. Um, but like as you mentioned, this is something that's going to help us re uh, remove those those old vehicles. We have all seen them, especially I know that a lot, a lot of us in Southern Nevada have been down Charleston or Sahara, and we run into one of these older vehicles that all of a sudden hits the gas, and there's a big black cloud of smog behind them. And those are the vehicles that this is this program is intended to, to address um, so that they can either get that vehicle fixed or that they can replace it because now there's there's going to be incentive programs. Um, so again, thank you for, for um, help, uh, helping push this bill forward. And we look forward to working with, with you and the rest of the Nevada Conservation Network. Thank you, Rudy. Um, Assemblyman Watts did have to jump. As we said, it is a very busy day today. Um, but something that whenever we talk about this bill, something that Rudy pointed out one time that I thought was pretty funny was, you know, when you see like a Toyota or a Honda <laughs> that was made in the 1990s and it says classic car and you're like, this is not a classic vehicle. Those are the types of vehicles that Rudy is talking about um, addressing in this bill. So don't get mad at me if you own one of those cars, just giving you guys some additional context. Um, thank you so much, Rudy. I really do appreciate you taking the time um, to talk to us. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is where we're going to give a little bit of a transition and we're going to talk about the priorities of the Nevada Conservation Network. So the piece of legislation that Assemblyman Watts and Rudy talked about are one of the five priorities. Um, the Nevada Conservation Network came together and we voted on our top five priorities to focus on for this session. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Ian with plan. He's going to give us a little bit of an overview of a piece of legislation that NCN is working with in coalition with plan. Um, before I turn it over to Ian, I just wanted to give a shout out to Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. She was supposed to join us tonight. She's very busy. As you all know, again, it is the very first day of session. So we appreciate her trying to take her time um, to come to talk to us, but we will have a lot more opportunities to engage, engage with her and other legislators throughout the rest of the session. Um, so Ian, uh, yeah, I see you there. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go, we're going to give you the ability to share your screen. Um, that way you can give us a little bit of a presentation about the legislation you're working on. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, hi folks, Ian Bigley. I use he, he, him pronouns. I'm a lifelong resident of Reno, Nevada, and I work as the mining justice organizer with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be here tonight as a part of the Nevada Conservation Network's agenda, and I'll be stealing the screen here. So we do, I, and I want to thank um, Vernon and San for providing that land acknowledgement at the beginning. Um, we do include those in our presentations um, as well at plan. So throughout Nevada, there are indigenous people who have been displaced from their homelands. These are the Western Shoshone, Washoe, Southern Paiute, Northern Paiute, and Goshu. These phenomenal indigenous people spent their lives connecting with the earth and protecting these lands, and they continue to do so. So starting out, um, it's important to contextualize the proposals to reform mining revenue within Nevada's broader revenue structure. The pandemic not only exposed the inadequacy of our public funding to meet the basic needs of hardworking Nevadans, it also necessitated cuts to services vulnerable Nevadans need, uh, need most. In Nevada, we rely heavily on gaming and sales tax, and this contributes to Nevada having the fifth most regressive tax structure in the nation. This means that the bottom 20% of Nevadans with an income of less than $20,000 uh, $20, a year pay 10.2% of their daily income in taxes, while those with an income of over 400000 or higher play, um, pay about 1.9% of their income in taxes. So there's a great disparity there. Uh, moving into what the mine tax structure looks like, uh, Nevada is unique in that our current mine, uh, mine tax structure, the net proceeds of minerals, is written into our state constitution. This is why it takes passage through two legislative sessions and on a ballot of the people to make a change. 
And the important piece of information to take from the slide is the definition of net proceeds. Although tax policy uh, can be complicated, at its core, net proceeds is simple. Mines calculate net proceeds by subtracting a number of deductions from their gross revenue and are taxed on the resulting net proceeds figure. And the current policy is a 5% cap on net proceeds. So here's a list of the deductions uh, that mines are able to take to calculate their net proceeds under NRS 362. Mines currently deduct everything from exploration to mine development and even cleanup costs from the taxes they pay. In 2019, these deductions totaled over 5 billion. Additionally, it's not uncommon for deductions to exceed net proceeds, resulting in mines effectively paying no extractive taxes. In 2019, for example, 13 out of 30 gold and silver operations in Nevada uh, grossing a combined $700 million, paid zero extractive taxes to mine Nevada's minerals. And although mines pay the same taxes as other businesses, uh, tax equity is important. This means taxing similar industries in a similar way. And extraction is not the same as other businesses. It's an industry which monetizes a finite resource that belongs to the public. And once the resource is extracted, there's only one opportunity to tax it before, we're, before it leaves, and we're left with a scarred landscape. And that's why there's extraction specific taxes. So before discussing the current proposals, uh, this slide provides a snapshot of how our mine revenue structure currently functions. In 2019, the industry grossed over $8 billion, deducted 5.3 billion and paid taxes with that 5% cap on 2.5 billion uh, net proceeds. The total tax collected was 122 million and those funds are distributed roughly evenly between the county and state. So at the end of the day, out of um, $8 billion, just under $8 billion in gross revenue, 61 million uh, made it to the state's general fund. It's also important to consider how Nevada's uh, mine revenue compares to other Western states. So the first box here uh, shows states with the net smelter return tax, which captures a greater value than our net proceeds tax since the tax is applied after value is added to refinement. The second box is states with a gross tax. And I'd like to point out here, that, for example, Montana is in both the first and the second boxes. Uh, that's because they have both a net smelter return and a tax on the gross. Um, Nevada has unique language uh, with, our mine, uh, with our mine taxes saying that we can uh, only apply a single extractive tax. Uh, therefore, it's necessary to address the language in the constitution to modernize the revenue structure. So moving on to the proposals that we have now, uh, there's three current resolutions that all pass through the special session and will be heard this session. Um, so given the necessity to have an equitable approach to balancing our budget and not only making cuts to services Nevadans rely on, we really believe that we can win on any of these proposals at the end of the day. And what, you know, what's really the focus is we need to fund our schools for a bright future. Um, we need to invest in, in our education and healthcare in the state. So just a brief walkthrough, AJR1 would switch from a net to a, a net tax to a gross tax set at 7.75%. And this proposal stands out since it earmarks 25% of revenue to be spent only on healthcare, education, or economic assistance. AJR2 is the most similar to our current tax structure. This proposal would maintain net proceeds and raise that cap from 5 to 12%. And SJR1 is similar to AJR1 in that it would switch to a 7.75% tax on the gross. However, half of the revenue would be distributed through direct payments to Nevadans, similar to Alaska's oil and gas dividend. So it's a necessity to seek new revenue at this moment. And while mining revenue alone is not enough to solve our, our state's budget crisis, we believe that AJR1 goes the furthest. Uh, at plan, we believe that AJR1 goes the furthest in addressing the needs to fund our state's public services, particularly for healthcare and education. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this today. Um, we're going to go forward and we're going to um, finish all of the discussions for the rest of the panel members. But if you guys have any questions for Ian, again, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. What we're going to do is we're going to run through the rest of the presentations um, and then we're going to circle back and ask any questions that we have in those last 15 minutes. Um, and I know that right now we're taking some time and we're talking about the policies that all of the organizations are going to be looking at. Um, what I will say is sometimes it's 
little bit difficult to follow a lot of the heavy policy jargon. Um, don't let that discourage you from the process. All of us are more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you to sit down, to dissect some of these issues a little bit more, or to even tie you into all of our efforts that we're going to have during session. So please, if you have any questions or if you'd like to learn anything else, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dylan. He's with the Natural Resources Defense Council. They're actually prioritizing two bills this legislative session. So we're going to give him a little bit longer time so we can talk about both of those pieces of legislation. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, thanks, Marna. Uh, so good evening. It's great to see such amazing attendance from Nevada's legislative leaders, stakeholders, uh, and most importantly, Nevada residents who are interested enough in climate, uh, fiscal conservation policy to spend a big portion of their uh, of their evening with us. So thank you. Uh, I'm Dylan Sullivan. I'm a senior scientist in the Climate and Clean Energy Program of the Natural Resources Defense Council in RDC. I'm based in Reno, and I'm going to talk this evening about two conservation community legislative priorities that I've had a big hand in. Uh, one is responsible energy planning legislation. Uh, the second is energy efficiency legislation. Uh, but first, I want to give some context for this work. Um, the climate crisis is here in Nevada. This summer in the middle of COVID, when I was most in need of the outdoors, many of the days I, I couldn't leave the house and go for a hike because breathing was dangerous due to wildfires that ultimately burned 4% of California's land area. That's bigger than like burning all of Connecticut and at a big chunk of Rhode Island there. It's, it's, it, it, you know, it burned a huge amount of land, resulted in smoky skies in Nevada and even further east. Uh, also last year, Nevada and our neighbors in the Southwest and California, we had our warmest Augusts on record. Uh, and we know that heat waves like this, they, they, they impact uh, low income people and historically underserved communities the hardest. Um, and you know, without, without action, it's gonna get worse. Uh, so we really do have to take action. Um, but what does Nevada have to do to get to zero climate warming emissions by 2050, which is what scientists say is kind of the minimum necessary to give us a hope of a safe climate? Well, to answer this question, what do we need to do to get to zero? In RDC, working with the Sierra Club and really well-regarded consultants, modeled how the state can reach uh, 2030 and 2050 greenhouse gas emission reduction goals that were put into law in 2019 and that uh, Senators Brooks and Majority Leader Canizaro uh, both mentioned. Um, we released a report in mid-October that detailed our findings, uh, which included a focus of how to do this transition in a manner that prioritizes low-income uh, people and communities of color, who of course bear the brunt of air pollution in Nevada. Um, our report, which I'll put in the chat after I'm done talking, uh, showed that Nevada really has to do three things to get to zero emissions. Um, first, we need to get a lot more of our electricity from renewable sources like solar, wind, and geothermal. We need to get to high levels even sooner than is required in the renewable in the renewable portfolio standard that's on the books in Nevada. And I worked a lot on that, so uh, it's great. But we need to do even more. Uh, we need to do more because a clean electric grid makes possible the next task, and that's using this clean electricity instead of fossil fuels to move around town. So by that I mean electric vehicles, electric school buses, expanded public transit options. Uh, but also using this clean electricity for those things where we currently use so-called natural gas in our homes and businesses. So it's actually the fossil fuel methane and it's a potent greenhouse gas. Nevada produces none of it. We spend uh, like 1.8 billion a year buying it from other states. Um, using uh, renewable electricity uh, and, and, and using efficient electric technologies like heat pumps and induction cooktops to heat our homes, to get hot showers, to cook instead of using methane gas, um, which has troubling health effects in addition uh, to contributing to the climate crisis. That's something that we need to do. And of course, the third thing that we have to do to become, uh, to meet our goals is to become uh, a lot more energy efficient because using less energy in our homes and businesses makes the whole task of replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy a lot easier. Uh, and a big benefit of these combined approaches is that it allows Nevada to use uh, its solar resources, which are the best in the nation, and other renewables to power the state instead of out-of-state fossil fuels. Uh, so with this background, I'll turn to the legislation. Uh, first uh, is responsible energy planning, uh, which is sponsored by Assemblywoman Leslie Cohen. The basic idea of this bill is that as Nevadans use less methane gas uh, 
in homes and businesses in the future, gas utilities are at risk of wasting ratepayer money on unnecessary construction projects or on expanding their service territories to bring methane gas to communities that don't have it now. Uh, gas utilities are going to want to do this because their business model is getting a return on infrastructure investments. That's what we pay for in our monthly gas bill. Uh, so this bill is about making sure that we get the best return on our energy investments in the years to come. And that means that we have to scrutinize investments in gas infrastructure that we might not be using in the coming decades. And also considering alternatives like solving the energy need with clean energy uh, and clean electricity instead. Um, th this bill, Responsible Energy Planning, also tasks the body that regulates gas utilities, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, with looking at the future of gas utilities and gas use in Nevada to make sure that we have an orderly transition that provides opportunities uh, for gas workers and prioritizes low income and historically underserved communities in the transition. So that's responsible energy planning. The second piece of legislation uh, that I'm working a lot on is energy efficiency legislation. Uh, so energy efficiency programs exist to help businesses and households save energy uh, and saving energy means saving money on uh, our monthly energy bills. Uh, the basic idea here is that it needs to be easy and affordable for customers at all levels. So homeowners, landlords, renters, business owners, uh, to make the energy efficient choice that will save money in the long run. Uh, you know, say your gas furnace breaks. Uh, when you're looking to replace it, a few things have to happen if you're gonna choose uh, an electric energy efficient uh, replacement. Your HVAC contractor needs to have a high efficiency model in stock. He or she has to know how to sell them and they have to be priced comparably to the standard model that you would just buy anyway. So that's what energy efficiency programs do is that they, they just make it easy to choose energy efficiency. Now, NV Energy has existing energy efficiency programs, but they're not big enough. And this really has to be a priority. Uh, our modeling shows that we can't reach our climate goals with, without energy efficiency. Um, and programs are a really important part of the solution. So this bill does a couple things. It, it Number one, puts higher targets in place for how much energy NV Energy's programs uh, should save. Uh, number two, it increases the amount of budget that NV Energy needs to devote to programs that are focused on low-income customers and historically underserved communities. Uh, number three, it gives the PUCN, uh, sorry, the utility regulator, the option to designate a third-party entity to run programs uh, if NV Energy uh, doesn't want to do so. And uh, finally, it makes NV Energy or whoever runs programs come forward with, with programs that, that give customers electric options when their methane gas uh, appliance breaks. Um, so these aren't the only two bills we'll be working on this legislative session, but they're uh, two that I think are gonna have really critical impacts for the state, uh, reducing air pollution, reducing monthly utility bills and uh, working toward our climate goals. So thanks. Thanks Dylan, we appreciate you taking the time. Um, once again, please go ahead and stay on the chat with us. We are going to monitor the chat box and we're going to ask questions right after our very last presentation. Thank you. Um, last but not least, we're going to turn it over to Christy Cabrera. She is our policy and advocacy director here at the Nevada Conservation League. Um, Christy is absolutely amazing. We would not have a great understanding of all the policies that we do if we didn't have Christy on our team. Um, so yeah, Christy is going to give us a brief rundown of the last NCN legislative priority. Go ahead, Christy. Thanks, Berna, and hello again, everyone. Um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about Nevada's iconic wildlife and open space that we all know makes our state such a great place for both all of us and wildlife to call home. Um, but we also know that there are some threats to our open spaces and our wildlife. Urban development can threaten our wildlife by consuming and fragmenting their habitat, cutting off important migration corridors, um, and impacting the quality of air or water that they need to survive and to thrive. However, with thoughtful planning informed by experts and using the best available science, many of these impacts can be avoided or minimized so that we can meet the, meet, meet the needs of Nevada's communities while protecting habitat and environmental quality for the benefit of wildlife and Nevadans alike. So we are advocating for a bill that requires developers to consult with the Nevada Department of Wildlife on any significant development proposals or plans. Developers would have to state the impacts to both wildlife, wildlife and habitat when they submit their proposals. 
the local government or other permitting authority would then be able to take this information into consideration when deciding whether to approve a project, deny it, or require some kind of mitigation effort. This would be the first step towards encouraging developers to avoid impacts to wildlife and habitat. Uh, Nevada's lands and wildlife have become even more important during the COVID-19 pandemic with families seeking solace in nature for recreational opportunities and health benefits, affirming the connection between our land's health and our community's health. We're looking forward to working on this bill uh, with sponsor Assemblywoman Sandra Howdigie uh, to move it through the legislative process and make progress in protecting more of our wildlife and open spaces that make our space our state so special. Um, and I think I'll pass it back to Verna to see if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, Christy. I appreciate it. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna dive into the question and answer portion. Um, I actually see one question that I wanted to present in the chat box because when I learned this statistic, it was fascinating to me. So the question is what impacts to public land, what are the impacts to public land access or outdoor recreation, for outdoor recreation? Um, I actually learned this recently. So apparently Nevada's outdoor business economy generates $1.1 billion for the state and also about 87,000 jobs. And I think that this was most evident um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, as most of you know, uh, when you couldn't go anywhere else, everyone was going hiking, everyone was going outside. People do love the great outdoors. Uh, a lot of people who have visited specifically Las Vegas from all over the country or my family or my friends, when they visit, they say, like, wow, we did not know that there was such beauty around and there was beautiful mountains all the way around the city. And I know the first time even I went to Reno, I was in awe. So I think it, we have a really unique opportunity to address a lot of things here in Nevada, not just access to clean energy um, and ways to move away from fossil fuel sources of energy, um, but also we have a we are one of the few states that has just absolutely beautiful and wonderful public lands that we need to make sure that we keep safe and that we prioritize. Um, so that's just my little my little two cents before we dive into a deeper question and answer portion. So all of the panelists, if you can do me a favor, if you could please turn your cameras on. Um, all of these questions are going to be directed at you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Sierra. He is our new organizing manager at the Nevada Conservation League. He's been monitoring some questions in the chat box and he's going to go ahead and shoot some off to you all. Hi, Verna, thank you for the introduction. Uh, First question goes to Dylan. Uh, can Nevada push for a net zero energy building bill? And how can that be done? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think something that, uh, you know, we're focused on in the, I guess, in the medium and long term is, uh, of course, the, the best and easiest time to make a building sustainable and energy efficient is, is when it's, it's first built. Uh, because if you don't do it, then you have to go in later and it's a lot more expensive to, to go in and fix things than it is to build it right the first time. So I do think that, you know, going forward, uh, we'll be looking at opportunities to work with, uh, with local governments, uh, and also, at, you know, with, with state agencies to, um, uh, to, to really make sure that we have we have policies in place and good building codes that make sure that we're building buildings right uh, at the first time. And I think eventually, you know, that means that you know we need we need to have buildings that are electric and efficient when we build them, um, so, so that we're not creating problems uh, down the road. When we look at how we're going to meet our climate goals, we're going to have to have really good buildings, uh, you know, that are built uh, with a lot of insulation and a lot of energy efficient features at the start. So yeah, I, I think we need to move in that direction. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, the next questions go to Ian. First, is it possible for you to share the PowerPoint? But more importantly, second, um, will any of the mining tax proposals provide funding for conservation or environmental cleanup? Yeah, so, you know, as currently written that there's not money earmarked similar to the money for healthcare, um, education uh, or economic development. Um, however, I would say is it um, having significantly more money coming into our budget uh, from that industry does provide the opportunity for other conversations to be had. Um, my understanding too is these three proposals since they pass through the special session, uh, if there were changes, they would have to come through accompanying legislation, not amendments to the bills themselves. 
Um, but I do think for sustainability long term, this is one of one thing that I'm I'm excited about these bills about a short term. They're, they're addressing these really serious issues with our budget crisis and long term. If we're bringing in more um, revenue from this industry, there is the possibility then to, to reinvest in our rural communities for non-extractive industries in ways that can move us away from polluting and destructive industries and better protect these, these special spaces that we all depend on for our life. Thank you, Ian. And this question goes out to anyone on the panel. Um, can any of you explain how red rock mining is a threat to public lands because of a 150 year old federal law? Was that, uh, could you re uh, repeat the question? I apologize, I missed the beginning. No worries and my apologies. Um, this question goes out to anyone on the panel. Uh, can anyone explain how red rock mining is a threat to public lands because of a 150 year old federal law? I heard red rock mining, but I'm thinking it's hard rock mining and it's referring to the 1872 General Mining Act. Um, which we're really hoping to see some federal reform on now that we have, you know, a new um, administration and a plan. We've done work on reforming 1872. And yes, that is, that's the reason why, you know, we went over the revenue for the state. Mining operators on federal land pay nothing to the federal government, zero in royalties because of the 1872 General Mining Act. It's also deeply important to protecting um, our public lands. The 1872 General Mining Act says, quote, uh, that mining is, quote, the highest and best use of public lands. So effectively, um, how, we're, uh, how we're legally managing these lands is they're held in trust for extractive industries. And if there's not an interest in extractive industries, they can go to other uses. So to truly protect these public lands, that is another piece to this puzzle. Thank you. And my apologies again if you, uh, for any uh, mispronunciations. <laughs> Uh, even though I have glasses, I can't read all that well. But more importantly, uh, this question goes out to anyone on the panel. Why isn't geothermal a viable energy alternative? Uh, this is Dylan. Uh, I can respond to that. It definitely is. Um, and I think as, as we go uh, further down the path of uh, decarbonizing our electricity system, you know, it can't just be all solar. Uh, we're we're, we're going to have to use... Um, you know, in our model, what we show, uh, you know, when, when the state gets to really high levels of renewables, you know, we need something that isn't solar to help fill the gap. Uh, and that could be, uh, you know, it's probably going to be a combination of out of, out of state wind, uh, energy storage and uh, geothermal resources that are located here in Nevada. So it, it definitely is. Uh, it definitely is part of the solution. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, another question coming in here is, are there any other plans that will help lower income communities transfer to energy vehicles? I can try to take that one. Um, so we talked a little bit about the smog bill that Rudy and Assemblyman Watts talked about um, and hopefully trying to get some electric vehicle and hybrid incentives um, for low-income communities. Uh, I know there's also a bill out there, Senator Brooks, I believe touched on it earlier, um, to expand electric vehicle charging um, all over Nevada, including in low-income communities. It's hard to have an electric vehicle if you don't have a place to charge it. Um, so we're, we're trying to do every little bit while we can, but we're, we're constantly taking that into account and constantly trying to make sure that we're getting to the communities that need it the most. Thank you, Christy. Another, another question coming in here is, for net zero buildings, are there any plans to keep electrical wires underground to avoid blackouts during storms? Um, this is Dylan again. I don't think there are. Uh, and it's just kind of a thing that's pretty common in the US. Uh, you know, most of the distribution system, uh, the wires that get the electricity from a um, from a substation to your house, those have typically been above ground just for reasons of cost. Uh, if you go to some other countries like Germany, for example, they've just buried it all. It's just kind of different, uh, different values assigned reliability. So I, I haven't heard a lot on, on changing that. 
Thank you, Dylan. And one question that was asked for Rudy is, how can we ensure more opportunities for communities of color to gain access to the outdoors? You know, I think uh, one of the legislators mentioned, um, it's just being part of, uh, of the process, making sure that our voices are being heard and, and taking action. I know that this session is gonna be a little bit different, but don't let that deter you uh, and make sure that you're participating in any way that you can. Uh, Use social media. They're always paying attention to social media. So make sure you're communicating with them through social media. Make sure that you um, follow the plan page, the Chispa page, the Nevada Conservation page, um, in order to make sure that, uh, in order to follow the events that we have and anything that's going on in the community to, to make sure that you're staying active. And I think that's that's the big thing. Make sure that you're you're staying active. Thank you, Rudy. And then another question coming in for Ian: How long will legislation take for mining reform? So for the mine revenue reform, uh, since their resolutions for an amendment to the constitution, um, the proposal that we went on uh, this session will go on to a ballot of the people in 2022 and take effect in uh, 2023. Um, however, for other reforms that would be needed and kind of seeing off another question of, you know, how, how are we doing on mining reforms as far as the need for mining for producing re uh, renewable energy technologies. I do believe that there's a lot more we can do there uh, to make sure that not only are we having a just transition to um, energy production, but the sourcing of materials is just as well. Um, and those are things that we've continued to work on a plan and, and do believe that there's lots of opportunities um, and not as many being heard this session, um, but to improve that. One thing I'll lift up from this session is um, we, we do support Assemblywoman Peters' um, proposal to enact a study group to form an environmental justice review process. Um, that's important too, given that, you know, we do environmental review for mine projects on federal land under NEPA. However, we have no state level review process. And it's important to have an environmental justice element, especially considering for these mining projects uh, disproportionately infect indigenous peoples. Thank you, Ian, and thank you to all our panelists for, ask, uh, for answering all of these questions. Uh, for anyone who still has any more pending questions, please feel free to visit our website, nevadaconservationleague.org, or our Facebook or any other uh, of our social platforms, and feel free to give us a follow and ask us any questions there. Uh, with that said, I'll pass it back to Verna uh, to lead, uh, to close out our conversations. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, this was a really good discussion. Um, the chat box was popping, which shows that there's a lot of really good things, good conversations happening. Um, thank you all again for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you to all the legislators that took the time to talk with us on the very first day of session and to all of you that stayed on until almost seven o'clock at night to hear about the conservation priorities that we have here in Nevada. Um, I just wanted to re-emphasize what I said at the beginning. I know at the beginning we were kind of in a rush trying to figure out if we were able to have legislators on, um, but there was some pretty important content that I wanted to make sure that all of you heard. Um, as, an, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Nevada Conservation League Education Fund conducted a poll that found that 82% of voters in the state consider climate change a serious problem. 60% considered it a very serious problem. So an overwhelming majority of Nevadans support lawmakers taking strong action to combat climate change, and they believe that this will generate a positive impact for future generations, for our community's health, and for our economy. And I think that that is most evident here that on the Zoom, we had up to at one point over 170 people listening to these conservation priorities. It just goes to show that a lot of Nevadans do care a lot about these issues. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Just one more time, I wanted to give a shout out to all of the partners that joined us for this call. This was definitely a coalition driven event. I know that only about um, four or five of our partners uh, had legislative priorities to speak on, but that's because they are the um, experts in the room. As always, these are not going to be the only five bills that we pay attention to. There's a lot of other pieces of legislation that the coalition is going to be tracking throughout legislative session. session. Um, so special shout out to the partners that were joined this event, Battleborn Progress, Chispa Nevada, Eco Madres, Environment Nevada, Friends of Nevada Wilderness, Get Outdoors Nevada, Great Basin Resource Watch, Moms Clean Air Force, Natural Resources Defense Council, Nevada Wildlife Federation, Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada, the Sierra Club, 
Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, Vote Solar, and Western Resources Advocates. Um, if you wanted to learn more about climate change or clean energy, our partners at Battleborn Progress are still hosting the summit. There's going to be a panel discussion that talks a little bit deeper in details about energy, climate change, and public lands on Wednesday. So show, be sure to check out their Twitter so you can follow along for that. And to everyone who RSVP'd, you are all going to get a couple of follow-up items uh, in your inbox. Um, you're going to get a document that has all of the legislative priorities that we discussed today. It's going to talk about what the legislation is, who the sponsor is, and what the benefit of that, that the, those pieces of legislation will be. Um, you're also going to get some contact information for all of the great partners that I mentioned that joined us today in case you want to follow them on Twitter, follow them on Instagram, on Facebook, or even send them some emails because you want to get folded into their program. And also, last thing, we're going to talk about conservation lobby days. So this is not going to stop here. There is another great event that's going to happen um, mid to end of March. Conservation lobby day is a day where typically a bunch of Nevadans hop on a bus, they go up to Carson City, and we talk to our legislators about all the conservation priorities that we have. Um, as you saw today, as we know, we are still uh, in the middle of a pandemic, but Conservation Lobby Day is still going to happen. It's going to take place online. Um, so be sure to stick to all of our Twitters and all of our Facebook feeds and pay attention to our emails because we're going to give you some really good opportunities to join us. Um, so yeah, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the event. Stay safe, wear a mask, happy first day of session, happy Black History Month, and thank you all so much for joining. You guys have a great night.